is of power because we are kings and our words matter. Man has authority today. You and I have authority in and through Jesus Christ. And that authority is expressed through our words. That is why we can speak to things. Every day we must speak saying what must happen. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Oh my soul. Worship his own. God begins the work of restoration in chapter 3, verse 15. You read about the first promise of the coming Messiah in verse 15. God speaks to the serpent and says, I'll put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Notice, he says, I'll put enmity between your seed and her seed. The Messiah is described as the seed of the woman here. Now, woman doesn't, women don't have seed. That's why when, when Mary was told by the angel, and the angel came and told Mary, you'll, you'll bear a son. His name shall be called Jesus, and he'll be the, he'll, he'll, he'll save the world and all that. When the, when the angel came and told her, she said, look, I don't know a man. That means I'm not even married. I don't have seed. How will, I, how will I bear a son and, 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 and give birth to a son? I don't have a seed. I just have this womb. If someone gives me the seed, then I can make the baby. No seed. I need a, I need a man. And the, Holy, and the angel replied and said, Don't worry, the Holy Spirit shall overshadow The power of the Holy Spirit shall overshadow you. And you will conceive and bear a son. Then she says, be it unto me according to your word. She receives that word. 
be it unto me according to your word. And then takes off straight to Elizabeth's house. You know who Elizabeth is. The same angel went to her husband before and told him, you're going to bear a son. Your wife is going to bear a son. He said, I'm too old. My wife is too old. Don't you know that? I need a sign that this will happen. And the angel gave him a good sign. <laughs> because if this guy kept talking like this, nothing can happen, you know, with somebody talking like that. No miracle can happen. So the angel shut him up. And there he's sitting in a corner and Elizabeth, I mean, Elizabeth and Mary get together. And Mary went in there and she says, He that is mighty has done great things, she says. How does she know that God has done great things? Nothing has happened yet. No conception has taken place. Only word has come that the Holy Spirit will overshadow you. You'll bear a son. Only the word has come. And she has received the word, saying, Be it unto me according to your word. That's all has happened. Nothing has happened. But she goes there and she says, He that is mighty has done great things. Talking about it as if everything has happened. He's done great things. She just had the word. That's all. But the word brought such joy, such rejoicing, just celebration before anything could happen. He that is mighty has done great things, she says. And they celebrate together. Only thing she had was the word. Even today, I tell you, when you receive the word of God just like Mary, into your heart and conceive the word of God in your spirit and speak it forth and declare what is going to happen to you and what will be your end and what is going to take place in your life. When you by faith declare it, it will be manifest in your life. That's the way things happen. It's a big faith story. And after the fall... The promise of the Messiah was given. Then God makes covenant with men one after the other, starting from Noah on. Then finally comes to Abraham and makes this grand, great covenant called the Abrahamic covenant. Very special blood covenant God makes with Abraham. Now this covenant is amazing. We have the blessing of Abraham today. That Abraham's covenant is what has brought Jesus and the redemption and everything to us. This covenant is very special because the essence of this covenant is this. That when two people make a blood covenant, they say in essence, many things they say, but the essence of it is this. It means that everything, if I'm making a covenant with another person, everything that I have belongs to him and everything that he has belongs to me. To symbolize that, they exchange weapons, they exchange all kinds of things. To symbolize whatever is mine is yours, whatever is yours is mine. If I need yours, if I need your help anytime, if I need anything that you have, I have, I have the right to take it, legal right by the covenant to take it. If you need anything from me, you can take it. I'm going to live for you, you live for me. That's the covenant. Everything that belongs to me belongs to you, and everything belongs to you belongs to me. This is the covenant. And God gave Abraham a child at the age of 100, and we know that, right? His wife was 90, he was 100. I mean, that was a precious child. Promised child. And all the future rests on this child. God said, in this child and through this child will all the promises come to pass. So everything hinges on this child, Isaac. Not on any other children that Abraham has. On Isaac. Through Isaac. That's the way it can happen. And all of a sudden, God comes and says... Offer your son as a sacrifice on Mount Moriah. Now, a lot of Christians have a big problem with this. And some Christians have gone the wrong way. They, they opened that particular passage in Genesis 22, and, and they even preach saying, God sometimes wants your child. Are you ready to give your child? If you love your child too much, then God may want that child, you know. No wonder many Christians don't go to church. Because they don't, they don't want God to find their child and take their child, you know. They have misrepresented God, you know, that as if he's one who comes around to homes and takes their children, you know. Uh, children that are living, takes them to heaven, you know. 
total misrepresentation because we don't understand what, is, what happened. Why did God ask for Abraham's child? Was God asking for a human sacrifice? Why did God ask for, a, for, for, for Abraham to kill his child? It is because of this. Because the covenant meant that everything that Abraham had was God's and everything that God had was Abraham's, now the covenant has to be proved. That is why the chapter begins, the temptation chapter begins saying, the God tempted Abraham. The word tempted can be better translated as proved Abraham. The covenant needs to be proved. What about, what, what aspect of the covenant needs to be proved? This aspect that everything that Abraham has now belongs to God. So God is saying, will this covenant stand? Is this covenant real? Do you mean what you said in the covenant? I am telling you to prove it. Give me your son. Prove it now. I want you to prove it. And Abraham got up and went and ready, got ready to offer his son a sacrifice. On the way, the son asked, where is the lamb for sacrifice? We got everything. You didn't get the lamb. Where is the lamb? And Abraham turns to him and says, God will provide for himself a lamb. That's exactly what he said. God will provide for himself a lamb. If God needs a lamb, he's going to provide for himself a lamb. Abraham believed God, the Bible says. He went there knowing that even if he killed Isaac, God will raise up Isaac from the ashes and give him back to him because all the promises rest on Isaac and God cannot lie. God has spoken the promises that he will come back with Isaac home. He believed it and was ready to kill him, daring to kill him. He just went and made an altar, laid him down there and took a knife and lifted his knife to kill him and God stopped him. This they don't tell in the story many times. They say, God has taken his child. God asked for his, <laughs> no, God stopped him. Didn't allow him to kill his child. He said, Abraham, I know your heart now. You will do it. You came and you just about killed your son. You just lifted your hands and I stopped you. Now I'm going to write in your account, credit in your account as if you killed your son. That's why the Bible says Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. It was accounted in his behalf as righteousness. God wrote in Abraham's account, this man keeps the covenant. He is obliged to keep the covenant. He has, he has obeyed the terms of the covenant and fulfilled the terms of the covenant. God said, this is enough. That's all I wanted to know. Are you willing to give everything that you have? Are you really part of the covenant? And uh, God stopped him on that day. Why did God do it? I'll tell you why. Because God wanted a covenant man on this earth because he wanted to do something great on this earth. He cannot just do it just by himself. He needs a man through whom he can do it. So who is the man through whom he can do it? Through a man who is engaged with him in a covenant that is ready to give everything that he has to that man only God can give, give everything that he has. Because Abraham was willing to give his only begotten son. He is called the only son. Abraham, God calls Isaac his only son, even though there are other sons. God calls Abraham, Isaac his only son. He recognizes him only because he is the child of promise. Just like Isaac gave his only son, God now says, I'm going to give my only begotten son, Jesus Christ. I'm going to give him. And I can give him because of the covenant. Because this man was willing to give. I'm also willing to give my only begotten son. And this time I'm going to really give. I'm not going to stop at the point of death. God who delivered up his son, not, did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. Romans 8.32 says, Jesus Christ was delivered up by God on the cross of Calvary to die for us. Abraham was stopped whenever he lifted his hands to kill his son. But God turned his face away and allowed his son to be killed on the cross of Calvary. Literally gave his son. God proved his love. It was the covenant. What was happening on the cross was a covenant. God wanted entry into this world. God wanted to work through Abraham, bring his son into this world. 
as a son of Abraham, as a seed of Abraham, and work these things out. And now he's got an entry. Through Abraham he works. So Jesus comes into the world as a seed of Abraham and dies on the cross of Calvary, not only bearing our sin and our punishment for our sin and the judgment of God upon him for our sin. But another thing also happens. See, when, when Isaac, when Abraham offered Isaac, when God accounted it as, as if he has done it, God looked at Abraham on that day. He said, because you've done this, verse 16 and 17 says, because you've done this, God said, I will, your seed will possess the gates of your enemies, of their enemies, it said. Your seed will possess the gates of their enemies. Now, this is not a simple statement about how Abraham's descendants will always have victory over whoever came against them. That is part of it, but that is not the major part of it. It, is a, it has a redemptive significance. The gates of enemies means this. You know, in those days, cities had gates. If you possess the gate, you got the city. If you can gain entry into the gate, you got the city. Enemy armies would come and gain entry into this. If they capture the gate and the whole territory is theirs, that's all. What God said to Abraham was, because you did this, because you were willing to give his son, your son, I'm going to give my son one day on the cross of Calvary. He will not only die for the sin of the world, but this will result in the devil, the devil who, def who, who uh, took away the authority that I gave to Adam, your forefather, and stripped you of all authority, and left you fearful, and left you defeated, and at loss. I'm going to deal with the devil through my son, through his death on the cross of Calvary, and get back that authority and all the rights and privileges that he had taken away from you and retrieve it back for you and give it back to you. That's the meaning of that verse. That verse has a redemptive significance. It says, your seed shall inherit or possess the gates of your enemies. The biggest enemy is the devil, the one, one that got uh, Adam into a big problem. Your seed are going to experience a receiving back of that authority that Adam gave up long time ago to the devil. That's what God was prophesying about. And when Jesus died on the cross, Colossians chapter 2 verse 15 says, having spoiled the principalities and powers, triumphing over them in it on the cross of Calvary. What happened on the cross of Calvary? Paul says, he spoiled principalities and powers, triumphed over the devil and all of his hosts and all of hell. He triumphed over, in it, over it. The territory came into the hands of Jesus Christ. He captured it. He stripped, one translation says. He stripped him of all the power and authority. Spoiled is one translation. One translation trans translates the word spoiled as stripped principalities and powers. Stripping is what? If you take a, an official, say, in a military or something like that, you strip him of his position and power. They take away his badges and all of those things that signify, symbolize his position and power and authority. They take away his uniform. That's what stripping means. They stripped him of all authority and position. That is exactly what, what happened on the, on the cross of Calvary. When Jesus died bearing our sin, bringing redemption for us, part of that redemption story is this, the stripping of Satan, of all the authority that was originally given to man, but was now given in the hands of Satan, where he has become the God of this world. God made man as the God of this world. Now it has gone to the devil. The devil became the God of this world. And God stripped the devil of all that authority that he had taken from man. And when God took it back, he took it back in and through Jesus Christ, the seed of Abraham, to give it to Abraham's seed. Because Jesus took it. He is the head and we are the body. Where is that authority now? That authority on earth is in the body of Jesus Christ. It's in you and I. 
it is with this background you can understand the authority this has a big story it's a redemptive historical story starting way back then to all the way to here and that's the story i try to tell you today and because of this only jesus says whoever shall say to this mountain be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea and shall not doubt in your heart but believe that whatever you say will come to pass you will have whatever you say whoever will say because man has authority man was made with authority man lost that authority jesus got back that authority that authority is part of our redemptive blessing today and we must use that authority that is why when jesus calmed the sea saying peace be still he turned around to the disciples and says where is your faith see they could not use their faith because they did not understand authority they could not understand that they could speak to the storm and say peace be still what he said they could have said that is why he said where is your faith why are you faithless why because they could have spoken and the same thing would have happened man has authority today you and i have authority in and through jesus christ and that authority is expressed through our words that is why we can speak to things every day we must speak saying what must happen you know in in this in zechariah chapter 4 verse 6 and 7 in the rebuilding of the temple during zerubbabel's time he encountered a lot of opposition people were working against it you know any time you do something good there will be some people working against it that's why i said there are a lot of creeps right <laughs> people working against it but you have authority no matter how many people work against it you have authority and zerubbabel was told at that time they were told at that time it is not by, that is the, that is where that verse comes it's not by power nor by might but by my spirit saith the lord here is this man trying to build the temple people trying to plot against him and stop this work and abort this <laughs> cause him to abort this work you know but uh, god says no 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 it's not by might nor by spirit but not by might nor by power but by my spirit god said and then he said you great mountain what are you before zerubbabel what are you before zerubbabel you will become a plain land he said you will become flat you will be gone you will not be even found there he says and then he says they will finish the work saying grace to it and grace to it why grace to it mention is two times in verse 7 in zechariah 4 because grace was there in the beginning grace will be there till the end grace every day grace now grace yesterday today tomorrow and forever grace to it grace to it he says they will be they will finish the work saying grace to it grace to it grace to it i think that is the that is the way we should finish the work saying grace to it when you face your problem mountain like problem you need to get up and every day speak to that and say you mountain what are you before sam chelladuri you put your name in there <laughs> what are you but you will become nothing you mountain you will be gone you will be laid flat you will be nothing you cannot stand you cannot oppose you cannot destroy you cannot cause any trouble you mountain you are nothing you'll be flat because there is grace to it there is grace to what we are doing there is grace there was grace yesterday grace today grace tomorrow grace forever in jesus name there is grace what is grace grace is god's ability that he is willing to use on your behalf even though you are unworthy god is willing to use all of his ability and power on your behalf even though you don't fully deserve it what's the problem then for some people they de- that the fact they don't deserve it is the problem <laughs> but grace means that even when we don't deserve it god is willing to use all his power for us so i say no problem grace to it grace to it every morning we should get up and say grace to it 
grace to it. And that's the way we finish everything that God has given us to finish in this earth. of the Lord.